My name is Diane. Um, today is a special workshop day. Today is beginner breakdown the basics. I'm hoping to kind of do this as a series. Um, today we're just going to be going through kind of the core poses of yoga. And I am also super ready to answer any questions you guys have. So if you have a live chat, if it's a little bit better, I think if you're on the laptop, I think you can do it on uh, a phone as well. Feel free to chime in, ask a question. Um, and then I will totally answer them. So you need some props. I have a big towel. Also a yoga blanket works. Also, if you can't hear me, let me know. I'm not using the mic right now. No Zoom, no. Um, I have a yoga block, one block. And I don't have a yoga strap, so I'm using a scarf. Cool. Those are the props that you will need. It also will help a lot if you have um, a mirror that you can see yourself in, or let's say that you have a second laptop or um, another device, right? Your phone or your laptop, the second device, and you have that kind of off to the side and you have that on a self camera view, just so you can see yourself, right? Since we don't always um, know what our bodies are doing. Hi, Cecilia. great, awesome Cecilia, thank you. Um, so let's just dive in. Yeah, yeah, I'll just keep checking in with the, ch with the chat. We are starting with the basic one is sitting. Hi, Sonia. Oh yeah, hi, Sonia. Wait, I got your news. Sonia, Dimitri, and Ro Ronan, thank you guys so much for joining in. Right, if you have questions, they're, from, they're joining from California. Super excited about that. Uh, also remember guys, tomorrow's Easter and tomorrow I am teaching. Slow, deep stretch Sunday, 12 o'clock. So definitely check that out too. All right. So sitting position, your basic yoga pose. We're gonna start looking at the formula, right? We're gonna start like what I usually do, sitting, all fours, cat, cow, down dogs, sun salutations, and then getting into um, warriors, things like that. Kind of quick analysis of each one. So block or blanket. Let me angle you a little bit. So a basic sitting position, we call it sukhasana, which means easy sitting. You have an option of taking your blanket slash towel, folding it up into a nice little pad. But you might not even need the pad. We usually wanna come into a cross-legged position with a nice triangle of space between the legs. So if you were to look down, you would see a space in your legs. A lot of times in Sukhasana, I see students with legs really far out or kind of really, really out in front of them, or they bring their feet tucked into their bodies or they're sitting like this. It's something that's superly wrong, but it does not give you so much base. So if you have your feet all tucked in like this and you're trying to move in poses, you can see my hips are lifting up and you're just have as much stability. So out in front, triangle space, the shins almost look parallel to each other. And then when we move in your Sukhasana and all the different variations you have, it's a very solid base. And you can see that my sit bones are not coming up off the ground but I have a lot of core and hip mobility, yeah? So sitting Sukhasana, you wanna make sure that we are not arching the spine. I see this all the time, this sway in the back. I used to do it. I also see this all the time. So you can check yourself out in the mirror if you can. You can, so sitting up straight, you can see how straight the spine looks here. It's not swayed. It's not hunched, it's that middle ground. So we have those two sit bones at the bottom of the pelvis, and that's where you want your weight to be balanced, those two little sit bones. If you're not quite sure where they are, reach back, pick up your flesh from out from under your butt, and that allows you to ground in the sit bones a little bit more. Options for Sukhasana, blanket, folded edge, under your sit bones, giving you elevation. You can, you can bring three blankets if you want to, as many as you need. This is gonna help you if you have that tightness in the hips, you have tightness in the low back. Also, if you tend to be someone that slouches, having the hips elevated gives you the space to extend and sit a little taller. Option number two, you can also come onto a block. I personally don't like sitting on blocks. I don't think it's very comfortable. It doesn't feel stable to me, but I know it's an option a lot of people like because it does give a little bit more height and it's a bit more solid than a blanket. I like blanket cushions. Another option you can do for your, if you have a wall, 
Next to you, actually, if you do have a wall, grab your wall. You can sit up, yeah, grab your wall. You can sit up against the wall, and here you can really feel the space in your low back. So you can even do cat-cow motions here. You can take an inhale and pull the shoulders back, puff the chest open, and you have that swayed back, kind of like cow pose. In your exhale, you can press your low spine into the ground, keep the shoulders touching the wall, head touching the wall. And that's a little bit more like a cat. You can go open, and you can go closed. And open, and closed. And this kind of gives you an awareness of your back space. And even as you're just sitting right now, just do a little cat-cow with me. So your inhale, open, sway back, and exhale, round. But this you're doing with intention, with awareness and purpose. You're trying to stretch. Inhale, open. Exhale, squeeze the belly in. Inhale, open. And squeeze. Now, can you find the middle ground and just neutral center? If you're not forward, if you're not backward, right in the middle. That's your sukhasana. So whenever we come into a sitting posture in yoga, this is how you want to sit. This translates into other sitting poses. So think cobbler. You start from here. One leg in, one leg out. Forward or open. Straddles. Pipes. Everything we want, that solid base sitting position. It all just kind of goes with you in other poses. Yeah? Hi, Heather. So does that make sense? Are there any questions about easy sitting sukhasana? No, if you think of something later, don't feel afraid to ask. You can always ask anytime. All right. I'm going to talk about breath for a second. A lot of questions I get from people are about when do I breathe? What pose do I breathe? Or is it exhale or inhale? The most important thing is that you're breathing. So don't get too caught up in this has to be inhale, this has to be exhale. As long as you are mindfully breathing through your practice, you got it. All right. If you are in a pose and you are holding the breath, if your breath is really short and forced, um, if it's high up in the chest and you're not breathing through the belly, these are all signs to kind of reset, refocus, right? Kind of maybe step out of the pose or take a lesser variation of the pose. You want that breath to be moving mindfully, smoothly, and with awareness. Now, that being said, let's talk about the refinement. So usually inhales are poses when your body is opening. So think inhale, you're opening the body, right? Exhale are poses where you're closing the body. And a very simple way to remember that is your cat cows, which we just did when we were sitting. So we had our sitting posture and your inhale is that opening, open belly, open chest, open shoulders. Exhale is a squeezing out, a rounding. Squeeze the navel into the spine, contract through your core muscles and close, you're closing the body. So that's why you'll see in, in our practice, we usually take inhales, we lift on an inhale, we fold on the exhale because we're closing the body, yeah? Uh, we do arm lifts, we do um, hard pushes with exhales because exhales makes you contract and then so you're using your core, keeps you safe. And let's talk about that belly breath for a second. So our traditional way of breathing is very high in the chest, and especially if you are someone who's prone to anxiety or stress, you're breathing high in your chest. Notice it any single time during the day, if you start to feel a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit stressed, a little bit anxious, check in with your breath. I almost guarantee you every time that you are breathing high and you're breathing shallow, all right? This is very, very common um, now that we're driving a lot now, but if you maybe can think back to when you were in the last time you were in traffic, or something, you were most likely breathing very high. So if your boss called you and said, we need to talk about something, whew, everything just goes really high and short in the chest. Everything kind of clenches up here. So yoga helps us to undo that stress effect. So the breathing is a big part of that. We usually breathe in and out through the nose. Na nasal breaths force you to have longer breaths, deeper breaths. You have to breathe slower when you go nasal than you do with the mouth. Mouth, you can breathe very quickly, very easily. Um, if you ever find yourself being very anxious in a yoga pose or even sometimes a little nauseous or dizzy, it helps to breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. That's also a cooling breath. If you start to get overheated in a yoga posture, in through the nose, out through the mouth. 
It's also a great way to um, bring that sound, that ha ujjayi sound into the breath and help you focus. So just do a couple in through the nose, out through the mouth. Go with me. In. Big mouth. That ha sound again. And up. One more time. In. And up. Good. And that nice ha. So where you are right now, just breathe through your nose. That's it. Nothing else. And just listen. So breathing through your nose, place your tongue at the roof of your mouth. And I want you just to feel it. Feel how that closes things off. Now keep breathing through the nose and place your tongue at the bottom of your mouth. And you should feel your throat open up. And you can hear the echoing sound of your breath. That's our ujjayi breath. They call it ocean breath. Um, modern times, Darth Vader breath. And that's the breath we want through the practice. So with the tongue down, the throat open, that echoing sound throughout the practice. You're engaging a muscle in your throat called the glottis when you make that sound. So it's a warming effect for your uh, throat. And if you go deeper than that, it is um, an activation of your throat chakra. So I think this is the area of talking, communication, love. Yeah, okay, expression can be from here. Very cool. So then you have your belly, right? We breathe high in the chest, we're gonna breathe it down. So you're, when you inhale, you're expanding your belly like a balloon, as big as you can. When the belly is full, then the breath moves up to the chest. When you exhale, belly, navel to spine, then let the chest soften. So it's a wave. Belly, chest, belly, chest. Belly, chest, belly, chest. So they move separately, but smoothly. And it's kind of hard to do that wave of breath throughout a practice, especially if you're like holding a really difficult pose, you're just trying to remember to breathe, which is fine. Or just breathe, tongue, mouth, open throat, let that breath flow. Yeah, we never want to, we rarely want to be in poses where we're holding our breath or closing our breath. All right, so that's what I have about breath. Anybody have questions on that? All make sense? Everyone's following along okay? All right, cool. Next pose. Um, you are going to come into, or we're going to talk about all fours, which is also called tabletop position. And tabletop is your basis for cat cows. It's a basis for a lot of poses. Uh, can you all still hear me okay, or do you want me to use the mic? Let me know. Okay. <laughs> so there are already can be a lot of issues just here, right? Knees and wrists and even feet sometimes. So if you have ankle foot issues, usually we would just curl the toes here or just be on the toes and that's fine. If you're able to, we have the top and the feet flat, trying to bring a little stretch right into the top of the ankles. Your blanket is there for you as a cushion for the knees anytime. Um, when we were in Costa Rica, we had didn't have blankets, or so we used beach towels, and we also used our shoes under our <laughs> under our flip flops as cushioning under the, under the knees. Anything works for cushioning. Your wrists, even I had a wrist issue a couple weeks ago, and I was modifying myself. Ideally, with the wrist, with the hands, ideally you have them spread, spread and flat, with your middle fingers facing straight forward. Now, there's another school of thought that says you turn slightly out, about 45 degrees where your pointer fingers, thank you, Slaya. Um, where your pointer fingers are facing forward, there's a lot of um, school of thought that says that that feels better in the wrists. For me, it doesn't. Mine feel better forward. But again, it's all just plain experimentation of what feels good in your body, okay? The right answer is what feels good. The wrong answer is what hurts, <laughs> right? So if you're going there, just starting with the basic, the ideal is that middle fingers forward, spread the fingers actively wide. A lot of times I see thumbs in. A lot of times I'll see fingers that look like this in classes. Spread, really open, engage. I also very often see space under the knuckles. 
So claw hands, I see this a lot in yoga. Every single time that our hands are on the ground, we don't claw the hands. We extend and try to flatten and try to press through the length of your hand. So just here, now push into your fingers. Just push. And you're gonna all of a sudden feel a ton of activation of the muscles to your hand, wrist, and forearms. And you've all of a sudden taken a bunch of pressure and weight out of the actual wrist and palm of the hand. So that's what we're looking for in any time your hands are on the ground. Down dog, handstands. Handstands, your knuckles do curl a little bit because your fingers will be activated. So mine are just, yeah, just kind of wiggling. That happens in handstands, but they're not pulled in, right? They're still active and still aware and adjusting. Options, wrist lift, keeping the fingers flat and the wrists come up. That is like doing a little elevation in your foot. Your hands and your feet are reflective. So if I were flat on the foot and I come up with the heel and if I were to press into those toes, that's the same idea. It's very good strengthening for the ankle if you're standing up and doing that. So if you do wrist lifts like this, it's very strengthening for the wrists. Really nice. If you do this at home, work your way up to 50. Even, even more, doing them in plank. I can't do that in plank. <laughs> my wrists won't do that. But I love wrist lift as an option, even in my down dogs. This feels so good on my wrists. Okay, maybe you always have the option to turn outward, and some people love it. I don't. <laughs> and your other option is fists. Fists are great. Stacking the wrist like this, there's no bend in the wrist. It's very solid. It's a very strong pose. Um, so this is a great option as well. It's kind of hard to do this in down dog because, again, this is a straight wrist, and we don't want um, angled wrists. We can have your fists. So if you're in down dog, you need a little bit less. The wrist lift is good. Then, of course, there's the elbows. Elbows are an option that can be done in most poses where you have an all fours position. So if I were here, I can do cat cows here. It's not as big, but I can do it. I can go into my down dog, or it's actually dolphin. I can move through the salutation series and come back. It's just a little bit different. This would be for like my mom who broke her wrist. This would be, that would be her option. I'm going to give you one more option to do in with your hands and all fours is using your blanket. So you have your blanket folded. So I have a long fold. Your folded edge sticking out to the front of the mat. And the palm, palm heel, as it a heel, the heel of your hand right back here. That's what's on your blanket edge and your fingers are on your mat. So that is like if you were wearing shoes with lifts in them or shoes with a little bit of a heel in them and how that can um, alleviate some pressure in ankles and feet. So that's an option for you anytime you're practicing. You can even make that a little bigger if you want to, right? So you can feel that angling of the hand and the wrist is a lot nicer for the body sometimes. This can be done. Planks, chaturanga, down dog. You can translate that to any pose where the hands are on the floor. Yeah, so sometimes if you're having two blankets, one for your hands, one for your knees, or oh, it can be a good idea. Last thing I'm going to say for all fours tabletop is the elbows. And elbows, again, are something that I see a lot. Anytime that you have weight in your arms, we do not lock the elbows. I, I do it too. So when I first started yoga, this is what my elbows looked like. Look at that. I have the hyperextended joints too. It took me about three years before I would stop doing this without thinking about it. So bend. For someone like me, it feels like I'm bending my elbow a lot, but you can just actually see I'm just straightening my arm. So check your elbows out, right? If you're someone who tends to hyperextend, what you're doing to your body here is you're locking the joint and you're not using any of the muscles to strengthen. So over time, you're just putting pressure in your joints and you're not strengthening anything around the joint. What we want to do is have that little bit of a bend. Straighten the arms, but don't lock the arms. And this way, you're using the muscles around the joint to hold everything strong and steady. You're not locking joints. Yeah, so this is what the knees do. I don't see it so often in knees, but very, very often I see that in arms. 
Um, if you're just extended out like this, a little extension, there's no weight in the arm. It's not going to hurt you, but it's still good to have awareness. <laughs> Bless you. It's still good to have awareness. You're not just shooting your arms out and locking, but have a little bit of that awareness of your body position. Okay. That is whoop, all right. Okay. That is your all fours and tabletop position. Questions? How's everyone doing? You understanding? Cool. All right. You can all chat with me, ask any questions in the chat. You can request a pose if you have a pose. You're like, hey, what about this? Okay. Let's do down dog. Okay. Downward facing dog is one of those very basic core poses of yoga. Um, it is a resting pose. It is a strengthening pose upside down. But again, it's a pose that I see done incorrectly so often. And the most often thing I see happening is people putting all their weight into their arms and not shifting back enough into the legs. I'm going to borrow Paul for this one. Yay! You're doing down dog. Paul's coming on screen, guys. Woo! <laughs> This is not that kind of show. <laughs> now we're facing down. I should start from all fours. Just start there. Okay. So I thought that was my husband, Paul. Yay! So in your down, in your down, you start from all fours. We usually start from all fours. There's different ways to start, but we'll start there. You have the toes curled. Cool. What we want is to bring the hips back toward the heels first. Yeah. And what that does right away is it puts your, it opens up the angle of the wrist. So now your arms are not stacked over the wrist anymore. You've pulled back, you've opened up that angle. He is now going to take his knees off the ground. And see how his wrist opened up even more right there? So that's a beautiful move. We're going to try and keep that wrist angle and this angle here of the arm as he scoops his tailbone up to the sky for his down dog. Okay. So his hamstrings are tighter than my hamstrings. A lot of people think you have to have straight legs and down dog. You don't. Much more important to have this beautiful angle from wrists all the way up to the tailbone. You can see how it's almost a straight line. It's gorgeous. We have no humping or rounding in the back. And it's okay if the knees are bent. You can always open up your feet wider as well. You can go as wide as the mat if he wants to. And that's going to be a little bit less intense on his hamstrings. <laughs> <laughs> so here is a gorgeous down dog, right? I also, a lot of times what I see, so here's the incorrect, if you don't mind doing it, to shift his weight forward. There, I see this all the time. See how that's not a straight line? We want tailbone to wrist straight line. A lot of times I see heads looking up, right? That's going to strain your neck over time. So we want our head between the arms. Between the arms. There you go. Um, you can come down for a second. <laughs> Thank you, beautiful model. Woo! <laughs> uh, when I very first started practicing yoga, um, a teacher told me that the aim of down dog was to touch your head to the ground. Um, I have very open shoulders, so for me that was easy. And um, show what that looks like. It's not. It's not correct. So I don't want you to do it. But what he taught was like my legs a little bit. My hamstrings a little tight doing this, touching the head down. And you can see my shoulders, see that hyperextension? So that's that same idea of like locking at an elbow, right? You're overextending the joint and you're putting weight into it while you're doing it, which will hurt over time. So, <laughs> yeah, he is handsome. Hi, Sanji. Mm. Um, so the shoulder, what happened is after a few years of practicing down dog like that, because I thought that was the right way, I, my shoulders were killing me. They were hurting. And finally, I started asking different teachers. I started uh, um, checking in with it. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, welcome so much. This is our beginner breakdown, Sanjay. So we, I'm, I'm here answering any questions about poses. We're just breaking down alignment. Um, kind of what's the most commonly things are done wrong in poses. So this is a no. This is the yes. Right? So you can see wrist to tailbone straight. Ideally, you have the leg straight as well. But remember, if the legs don't straighten, let them bend. 
it's so much more important to have the extension of the body. So even if I bend, you can see how it's really easy to shift weight and mess up the line. You want to press through the fingers. I like wrist lifts here. And extend your tailbone up and press. So you can even play with the shoulders a little bit. Feel that difference. All right. You can walk your dog, alternating bend to the knees. You can roll the hips around and stretch in the sides of your body. Twist. The head can look under the arms a little bit and twist side to side. Let's give a little neck stretch. Just a little turn. A lot of times I see people try and do this. Looking and looking. That doesn't do anything. Down and look and look. Yeah, press it to the length of your fingers. Tailbone tilted. Heels press. Toes try to lift. So there's your down dog. How'd that feel? Try it, all right, try it. You don't have to do these poses with me, but it's good just to kind of see what you're doing. Um, again, it's nice to have a, another camera facing back at you um, or having a mirror, maybe so you can kind of see yourself. Uh, hand, shoulders, head, feet, all right, very cool. And in down dog, traditionally the toes are facing straight forward and the feet are about hips width apart, maybe. Um, ideally, usually they're not touching together unless we're about to move into a flow. And yeah, your hair stretching hamstrings, calves, ankles, your back is long, you saw the shoulders are engaged, chest is opening, arms are working, fingers are working. And down dog, I always have to go around the room and correct those knuckled fingers. I also have to smooth it out, press it down, engage the hands. So important. People who all say that they have weak hands, weak wrists, um, one of the reasons is because they're not engaging the hands at all. Chin touching chest for down dog. Um, I, that is one way to practice it. It's not how I enjoy practicing down dog because one, it feels like it closes the throat and it, it doesn't allow the breath to move as fluidly as I would like. But I do know that's another school of thought where the chin to the chest in down dog is meant to close the throat and engage a chakra at an energy point there. Um, it's an extension of the back of the neck. It's more, for me, it's more about just being careful not to crane the neck up. So sometimes the cue of chin to chest is given just to make people drop their heads because they're so, especially someone new to yoga, they're always looking up because they're trying to see what's going on. And it's really hard for people to get used to the idea of not lifting the head. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope so. Yeah, let me know if it doesn't. If you have any other questions, that's what I'm here for. That's what this today is. All right. So let's, oh, we're doing great. Yeah, okay, great. You're welcome. Um, let's move into plank that will take us into Chaturanga Up Dog. So kind of through that little sun salutation series. Plank pose. Now we can always first have the option of half plank. And half plank is when you bring your sit bones back and you stretch the arms out. So this is your child pose. We'll come child pose, uh, break down more. We use this for half plank as more of a measurement. So where the hands are, where the knees are, if you pop up, there's your half plank, and you're there. And very, very good. Even when my elbows are not locked, they still look locked. I just have these high tendon joints, I know. Like, they're not locked though, and they still look like they are. Another way you can get to their half plank is to start from stacked all fours, arms, knees, arms and your shoulders, knees under hips, and you just walk it back a little bit. Or you just walk it forward a little bit. But half plank, your hips are level with the body, meaning just kind of from the head down to the knee is that straight line. So we're not breaking up the angle, right? We're trying to have it right about there and you're not dropping it because you're not an up dog yet. So that middle ground, so there's that extreme low, extreme high, middle. There's half plank. Great option. For fists are great for plank. There's a lot of weight in the arms. You can also be down to the elbows for less at any time. Now going to the full plank, you have to curl the toes and straighten the legs. And there you are. So what I see a lot is this. I always see this in plank. You need to pull in through the core. So think of that idea when you're in the, you do an inhale like a cow and the exhale like a cat, that rounding, that feeling of 
pulling in through the belly, the ribs, that is your tuck. That is your engagement in your plank. And actually it carries through so many poses, which is one of the reasons why we do cat and cow all the time in classes, right? This is your inhale cow, exhale cat. This engagement all here is core engagement. It carries through. All fours, as you can step back or from here, curl, lift. Yeah, you just go right from all fours, curl, extend. It's a little extension and a little way forward. Arms are under the shoulders and they're shoulder width apart. Not this, that's not plank. This, not here, not too close, just stacked. Yeah, well, plank pose. Don't sag. This is not plank. This is collapsing. That's going to hurt your back over time. You're putting pressure in the low back when you do that. If you find yourself collapsing your plank, drop the knees. Don't let the ego carry you over. Drop the knees. Even take a break and pull back. Plank. A little high is okay. I would prefer a person to be a little bit high than rather be too low. I don't like the collapsing. High means you're pushing and you're engaging. So that's okay too. Level or a little high. When you get there, it's very often perceived that all plank is is weight in your arms and that's it. You want to make sure you're squeezing sit muscles, pelvic floor, thighs. Everything's engaged. It's a fire pose. It's one of those poses that wakes up the body. Everything's engaged. It opens a heating pose. Um, it's also the pose that's going to reveal your own mind to you. So if you are holding your plank, you're going to start talking to yourself, guaranteed. You'll have that inner voice in there, and you'll get to really know what that inner voice is saying today, what tone it has, positive, encouraging, or negative and complaining, right? And then we can do those little energy shifts. Um, there's your plank. Let's go to... I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna, I'll do a try around, let's do up dog first in those variations. So let's start with the belly. We'll get into the transition in a second, but let's do the belly first. I'm just gonna start. So if you're someone that has low back issues, like I do, I like to open my legs a bit wide in my extension poses for Sphinx, up dog, or cobra. If you're looking for more challenge, you can bring your legs as close together as you want. You can big toes touch if you want. Yeah? So let's go with the little one first. If you have a lot of issues with the low back, shoulders, up dog, or even if it's, you know, it's the beginning of a class and you're not quite warmed up yet, you're not ready for the up dog, you have an option of sphinx. Sphinx is the very gentle. Elbows underneath the shoulders, press the ground away, look up, open. This is a lovely pose. Do it on the side. Elbows, sorry, shoulder over elbow, elbow under shoulder. I see this all the time in Sphinx. No. Elbows under shoulders. It's a 90 degree bend in your elbows. I also see this. See how wide my elbows are? I see this all the time. Elbows in, under the shoulders, under the shoulders, not out to the side. So. That's your good alignment, palms down. And just there, don't sink into your shoulders. Press the shoulders down, pull them back. So like, I can press them down, but they can still be a little bit forward. Push down, pull back, squeeze back, and look up. And there's lots of, lots of poses from Sphinx we can do, but it's not what it's about, just engaging Sphinx. Yeah, so Sphinx is your gentle option. Your second option for the Up Dog series is cobra. You come down to your belly. Your hands are by the sides of your chest. Elbows in, shoulders back. In. Shoulders can always be down, but you don't want the shoulders forward. Roll them back. And you feel it when you roll them back, you engage. Cobra, there is little to no weight in the arms. They're in, in, lift, no weight in the hands. And there's your cobra. So this is really most about your back strength and extension. Great way to warm up the back. Arms are engaged, rolled, squeezing in, in, in. Don't let the elbows fall out. Squeeze them in. Hands by the chest. If you want more, hands come back by the low ribs, by the waist. 
and squeeze them in. So no hand of cobra, our hands up off the floor. You can press, and if you press into the hands, you can get maybe another inch. So we're not trying to put a bunch of weight in the arms of cobra, yeah? Legs for cobra. You press into the tops of your feet, and when you press into the tops of your feet and engage your legs, your knees will naturally come off the ground. So they are engaged leg. Now relax your legs. Now engage. Relax. And engage. Right. So that's the difference between engaged leg. You also want that in your sphinx. You want it in your up dog. Cobra. Lift. Good. So from here, if you're feeling good, if you're feeling up to it, it's the full up dog. Up dog, we traditionally want the elbows stacked over the wrist. We call it chaturanga arms, that 90 degree bend in the elbow. If they're a little bit forward, it's okay. If they're a lot forward, it's okay. All right? And you're going to press up all the way. Nice. Can see how my legs are open? Because that's how my low back feels. I like how it feels when my legs open. You can even go wider if you want. I go right. I'm usually about that way. Two schools of thought with the legs in up dog. One is how I'm doing it. Just pressing down, knees down. Other way is knees up, thighs up, and pulling back. That's your second rule, uh, school of thought. So you can try both, and you can see which one you like. I personally like it when my knees are down. I feel better in my low back with that variation. Can I do the other variation? Yes. Does it feel as good? No. So... And sometimes I'll alternate throughout a class. Sometimes I'll do it with knees down. I might mix in a couple of the knees up just to see how it feels. I'm always trying to test the practice and test the body and see what's going on. Which one do you like better? Uh, yeah. yeah, so Paul also likes knees down. Um, he also has low back issues as well. So, and so you have those legs, right? Together or apart, knees down or press knees, knees and thighs up and extending. Now what's really, really important up dog are the shoulders. This is what I see all the time. All the time. I see this. And then, oh, and those hypertension elbows. And then people are just like, in their hearing, it's kind of like, okay, what am I supposed to do here? Uh, next pose, okay? So <laughs> you want to be, again, mindful, aware, and engaged. This is going to hurt your neck over time, your neck and shoulders. Hyperextended elbows, you're going to hurt your joints over time. So, fingers forward, or you're angled out if you want. A wrist lift is fine. Elbows are fine. But, I'm going to get my position. You want to press those shoulders down, down, and again, back. So, it's not just enough to push them down. you got to pull them back. Elbows are pulled into the body as much as you can. And there's a beautiful up dog extension. And you can always bring the hands further back and make it bigger. Hands a little bit forward forward, it's a little bit smaller. So this is okay. Hands in front are fine. You'll have some teachers that are sticklers about having the hands all the way back by the waist. <laughs> if it feels good in your body, you're right. All right. Do the thing that feels good. Yes, check alignment. Um, pay attention to technique. But don't ever let, when we get back in studios and stuff, don't ever let a teacher just come and grab you and like force your body into a certain pose, all right? Try it, if, you, if they make a suggestion. Try it, see how it feels. And if it's not for you, it's okay, all right? So up dog, I love up dog. I think it feels beautiful. I love this extension. We also wanna have our gaze either forward or up, right? Extended, open the throat. So I feel like we look down, I say this in class all the time, we look down too much in everyday life, phones, tablets, um, just in general, walking. So it's unnatural for our bodies to always be looking up. So our necks get weak there. Um, it's nice in the practice to look up as much as you can and extend and work the muscles of the neck and the jawline in the opposite way than down all the time. Yeah, it's really, really good for you. Uh, questions about up dog? Down dog, plank, everyone's good? Okay, we are gonna get to the nitty gritty of chaturanga. Chaturanga is one of my most nitpicky poses 
in classes um, and even in teachers. It is done so often incorrectly and I'm seeing people um, always complaining about their shoulders and their neck in Chaturanga and the reasons are, and the, and the wrists in Chaturanga and I'll show you the reasons why. It's because it's misaligned. You know, we get very caught up in the, what the pose has to be and we forget to take the variation when knees can drop in Chaturanga, it's okay. First of all, the arm alignment. You can do this just up and sitting, sitting any way you want. If you were in plank, imagine I'm in plank like this, arms are under shoulders. When you go to Chaturanga, you're actually moving your heart forward. So pretend it's my body moving and not my hands, but the arms would be down because you're pulling your chest forward, shifting forward. From there, that leaning forward lets you pull the elbows back into the rib cage, and you have what we call chaturanga arms, 90 degree. A lot of times I see this, that's gonna throw the shoulders out. Uh, if, you're, if you're collapsing, I see the falling. It's really more about the collapsing into it that's gonna hurt you. If you're mindfully moving through a low position and up, it's okay, because you're engaged. Is when people fall into it and they just lose all of the engagement and they just kind of collapse into their joints and bodies. And then they try to push out of it and force out of it without any um, good transition building. And then there's where you get your pain, that's where you get hurt. So if you were in plank, I'm gonna angle it a little bit more. So imagine in plank, I would inhale to bring my chest forward so that my chest goes in front of the hands as much as it can. And then I pull the elbows back pulling them back, so not this. I see this all the time, crashing. Oh, chaturanga, so much pain, extended. We also don't want to collapse into the shoulders. So as you pull back, watch my shoulders, they're still staying as level as they can. They're still opened. We're not going like this, right? We're not going back up dog. Plank, chaturanga, then you press into up dog and roll everything back. So how it looks, plank. Toes are curled to get the heart in front of the fingers, tips the toes. So even just that is a great drill. Tips the toes, tips the toes, tips the toes. Yeah? So you have your inhale, tips the toes, heart forward, pull elbows back. Chaturanga, scoop it forward, up dog. Again, I'm looking at you and I'm talking a lot, so I kind of uh, cheated a little bit. Let me do a full variation without any with just uh, good breath and good awareness. <sighs> Pushing back down, dog. Yeah? So we want to be able to lower the chaturanga with awareness and with control. What I see all the time, and maybe you do this, right? Try to see what you do. I see here, they're here, they're here, and they go, uh, and then they go, uh, and they go, uh, and then they're in their down block. And there's so much forcing and throwing out joints and hyperextending in that variation that is just not conducive for yoga practice, right? So if you're a person who has trouble with their chaturangas, knees down, heart forward, pull in, just halfway, just at 90 degree bend, and a little cobra, or up, and then come through all fours, then go back to downward facing dog. So there's your good variations, yeah? Um, second is your mini chaturanga. I'm a big fan of mini chaturanga. You're in your plank, pull forward, only one little bend in the elbow, like it with one inch, and push right there. And that's a great way to build up the strength. Yeah? All right. And I have one little cheat for your chaturanga that I love. I did it for a while. I really enjoyed it. From your plank, you pull in, but your elbows come in under your body. You bring them as close together as you can under the body. And what that does, it supports the weight of your body, and you can't, you physically can't go any lower than that bend. It's kind of nice. So how that looks, I actually really like this one. 
your forward, you pull in, and your elbows are holding up your body. So you're going to hang out there. And then you go up and pull back. Good? Right? Making sense. And if you have a, another school of thought that you were taught, any questions, anything that didn't make sense or that you have a question about my alignment, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not perfect either. So I welcome all the questions, please. Feeling good? All right, cool. All right, so let's go into ha, Uttanasana, standing forward fold. Standing forward fold. Let's see if I can get it in here. Let's say that we usually we transition to it from down dog. And let's go backwards. So actually you know what I look for. What I see happen all the time is people will walk their feet forward like this, and then they kind of go, and they kind of struggle and get there. Maybe they come back here and they go, and they're struggling. When you move from down dog to Uttanasana, standing forward fold, you do not move the hands. That's one of the hardest things I think for people to understand is don't move the hands. Let your legs adjust, which means the knees might have to stay very bent and the legs might have to open very wide, and that's okay. So if you're in down dog and you're gonna walk your feet forward, let them open, let them bend whatever you need. When you get there, when you get to the pose, then you can start to play and change things around a little bit. But don't move the hands. Ideally, the feet go between the hands or the back of the wrists and you fold here. So if I were to come angling this way, walk it forward, and fold. They can be open, they can be wide and bent. It's all good. Uttanasana, your hands must always, every time, must be able to touch the ground. They don't have to stay there, but they have to be able to touch the ground. Yes? So you're going to bend those knees and open those feet. Let go of the idea that you have to have straight legs in Uttanasana. It's not what it's about. Your Uttanasana forward fold, the main thing is the extension of your back and the spine that hinge of the hips, and that reduction of the stress and pressure from the low back. If, the way, then the second pose, second stretch is through the legs. The second piece of Uttanasana that's very important is your belly is touching your thighs. So you're hinging from the hips. The bend comes from here, not the low back. What I see in this pose all the time is this. And look at all this space between my body and my legs. Even with knees bent, I see this all the time. I see this. Oh, oh it hurts my back to do that. This hanging with a rounded back is going to hurt your low back. It's horrible. Don't do it. Please, all of you stop doing it and do it. Always hands on the ground. Extend from there. So you might have to bend the knees a lot to get your belly to touch your thighs. There is no open space between torso and legs. This is all closed off, all the time. Keeping that, we can take variations. Sway, head shakes, hugging elbows, pulling on the toes. Lots of stuff you can do here. And okay, that's another class. But I just wanted to get your technique. Next piece of that technique for your Uttanasana forward fold. Toes are straight forward. I see this all the time. I see this all the time. Still not straight. Toes parallel. Now, if the knees are bent, your knees must be in line with your toes. You can see how my knees are lightly open. A lot of times in the folds, I see people's knees do this. Again, this is a misalignment of the joint. This is gonna hurt your knees over time. And because of this misalignment, the hip and the ankle are misaligned and those are gonna to suffer too. Open. This also takes more strength 
to open and keep this in line. Yeah? So you're folded, you're moving, you're in line with your toes. Side view. Beautiful. Now note on feet. In your forward, actually any pose, any pose where your legs are on the, or feet are on the ground, hands down or feet down, you want your toes to be spread as much as they can and your arches of your feet lifted. Good. So I'm going to see if you can move. I'm going to get a good angle for you guys. Yeah, that's pretty good. My mat's a little bit soft with the carpet, so it's kind of filling the space. But notice that when you're, you pick your toes up off the ground, the arches of your feet naturally engage. Now, when you relax your feet, watch the arch, it flattens up. Lift down. So when you lift your toes, engage the arch, try to keep the arch engaged. Keep your toes down. Good. Now relax. Now just rock your feet out and in. So again, when you rock your feet a little bit out, you can see the arch lift and engage. Now, can you rock a little out? Now ground your big toes and pull up through that arch. There is some good active feet, all right? So people say they have flat feet. What they're actually meaning is they're not engaging their arches. Your arch is a muscle. It is a big muscle of the foot. You can work the muscle. You can create strength and you can create your own arch support. Okay, um, I'm very against big sneakers, those big running shoes or walking sneakers. Um, any shoe where you can't bend it, if you take the shoe in your, actually, I'm going to grab my shoe. Hold on. So none of us actually have any of those kind of shoes, thankfully. But here's the difference. So here is my kid's, uh, like, a boot. So here I'm trying to push the sole, and it doesn't really move. Like that. Ah, right? Okay. That's what you don't want in your everyday shoes, your comfy shoes, your walking shoes, your running shoes. It doesn't move. All right. He also has a pair of high-top sneakers. It moves, look at that, it twists, it bends, it's easy. This is great. If the shoe moves, your foot will move. And your foot is not just stuck in this solid thing that's not letting it move. Your foot is meant to move and flow. My favorite and my husband's favorite are these, what are these, Merrells? They're barefoot shoes. So these are, they call zero sole. And you just really roll up. There's a nice padding under the heel, but you have complete mobility of your foot, and it's wonderful. Quite any questions about shoes? Please be barefoot as much as you can. The summer is here. Uh, you're not going outside as much. You're not going to work. So there's no reason to wear those shoes that squinch your feet up into a little point and ruin your toes. Um, you don't need to wear high heels so much. Be barefoot around the house as much as you can. Walk on your tiptoes, and then that'll really help kind of bring some strength into your feet and ankles as well. Um, big things. I used to be a dancer, and I love, you know, if you look at dance, but besides ballet point shoes, dance shoes are flexible. Split soles, um, you move with it. Uh, modern dance is all barefoot. Awesome. Okay, so that was, where was I? That was Uttanasana. That was fourfold. And that, um, Extension of the head bending from the hips goes with you to sitting forward folds too. So, you know, Uttanasana is basically this. Same pose. Um, one leg in, one leg out. Same thing. But it's the idea of bending from your hips, this hinge of the hips to close off the space between the belly and the thigh. Okay. As I go this way, no space between belly and thigh. So we're not doing this. I see this all the time. It's not about your head getting down with all that space. It's about getting the belly, chest to lift, to go forward, and to pull up and out from the low back and the hips, right? So if you have a door hinge, that's where you are. Hinge, 
hinge, hinge. Not here, here. That's gonna hurt your back. Straight, the whole time. Very, um, especially for someone who slouches a lot, very, very um, difficult to get that into your practice. That's where a strap, if you're sitting, this is where a strap can come in handy. You wrap it around the foot, pull up, and use your arms to help you sit straight. Then pull forward, no rounding, straight. Same idea, yeah? All right, posture, Uttanasana, forward holding, hinge from the hips, belly to your thighs. Make sense? All right. All right, how are you doing? Woo. All right. Almost there, almost done. Let's see, let's go quickly through um, warriors, lunges. This is more about um, knee placement and foot distance. Really, but this really for the knees, but let's get that going. All right, um, how do I do if I were, I'm going to face you, if I, I'd be like, if I were in a lunge position, one knee forward, one leg back, what most happens to people when they say that their knees are hurting in yoga is they're losing their knee alignment. What we want is for the knee to always be in line with your toes. So my toes are, it's hard to see, but my toes are facing straight forward. What happens, watch, watch this knee, is as people move through poses, I see this all the time. My foot isn't moving, the knee is moving. And that is what I call wobbly knee. And it's going to destabilize the muscles of your knee joint, hip, and ankle. And it's so, so important that through lunges and warriors, the knee doesn't move. It doesn't move at all. It doesn't buckle in. So if you were in a lunge and I had you bring an arm up, an arm down, an arm up. These are just this is just variations examples. Watch how the knee doesn't move. It doesn't move. Go up, go down. A little wobble there. It's okay. I'm still aware of it though. It's natural for the variation. The muscles are working, but it's not buckled. Right? We're not losing it. So if I were to open out like I would for a warrior two, a warrior one, your body's facing forward, a warrior two, your body's moving out to the side. The knee doesn't buckle, stays out, presses outward. A standing variation. There's your warrior two. Hip squaring. Warrior one, open hips two. One, two. I see this a lot. You want to make sure the knee stays just over the ankle or a little bit behind the ankle is okay. Softer variations, the feet closer together. So if you're in a warrior two, close feet, less intense. But if your knee looks like that, it means you can go deeper, walk the back foot up. Warrior one, short distance, gentle. Big distance, deeper. A great way to do this also, you're also trying to line up your front heel to the back arch. See that straight line is? My back foot is not out here. It's not over there. Here, knee to arch. If I were to go to Lunge, warrior one, warrior two, watch that front knee. Lunge, warrior two. See how it doesn't wobble out, wobble in? <laughs> That's what you want from your knee, right? And already I can feel the knee joint strong. I can feel it engaged. What also helps is if you have that front knee bent and you're in your warrior two, if you glance, down at your front big toe, you can see the front big toe at the inside of the knee, your visualization, that line of sight. Big toe at the inside of the knee, the front knee. And that's how you know if you're pressing out enough. Those are the big things for the warriors. What I see the most is that misalignment of the knee, 
Yeah, because that is what's going to throw out your knees and hurt them over time. So that's a big safety thing for the warriors and the lunges. Make sense? Yeah? How are you doing? I'm going to assume silence means you're doing great. <laughs> Let's see what else we got. Um, let us move into, let's do bridge and shoulder stand, okay? Bridge and shoulder stand, you can have a blanket if you want to. Although, to be honest, it's very rare that I am in situations where there are blankets to be used and where they're used in a way that is very understood. Um, I'm sure I'm going to skip the blanket. I'm not going to use it. No blanket. Because that one just takes a lot more time with. I'll give you simple bridge and shoulder stands. So bridge is one of those basic common poses. Usually done at the end of a practice. Okay, that. Usually at the end of a practice, we have our feet close in toward the sit bones, and they can be about hip to the part if you want. And your arms, there's options with the arms. They can go over the head. Traditionally, they're down at the bottom. We have elbows bent like so. You can even walk your palms underneath your feet. I like that one. That feels really cool. Let's do traditional. Palms down, your heels as close toward the fingers as they can get. So some people can't walk them very far back, and that's okay. It's just as far as you can get. From there, when you're in bridges and shoulder stands, big safety cue, your head does not turn. I see it all the time. When you lift up and you put this body weight into the head and the neck, we do not turn the head because putting that body weight into it and then trying to turn it can crank out your neck. It's not used to that kind of pressure. Your neck and vertebra are very sensitive. Yeah? So if you're going with me, don't look at me when you're in it. So you can even just wait now and do it a little bit later. Here, you press to the feet and you lift the hips. So you can just do a little itty bitty one. That's a small bridge. To get you some more leverage, you can interlace your fingers under your body. You'll tuck your shoulders in under the chest. And you saw how that gave me just a couple inches more lift just from that. Then you press deeper through arms and feet and you lift a little higher. A little bit of squeeze your sit bone muscles, but that's not where you're concentrating. You're concentrating on the ground and pushing through the ground. Through the feet, you can lift up those heels if you want to. Chin toward the chest, press, 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 hips and thighs toward the sky, and then you can just come on down. And bring it in and stretch. So there is a bridge pose. Bridge pose are often seen as warm ups for back bends, very good strengthener for back muscles, legs. This extension of the arms behind you, try to get them straight, is, is a lot for the wrists, the arms, the shoulders, and then even squeezing them back and extending up through the heart. You're getting a beautiful shoulder extension, neck extension, and chest extension. It's a great pose. Um, shoulder stand. This one, questions about bridge? Everyone's good. Or if you have a pose that you have questions about that I haven't gotten to, um, I'm probably, this might be the ending pose today. So shoulder stand, um, maybe Shavasana. But if you have a pose we didn't get to today and you have a question about it, please type it in. I mean, I'm not renting a space or anything. I can, I can sit here and talk all day. <laughs> I got nothing else to do, guys. Okay, so shoulder stand. Um, I wish I was, let's do it. So let's first pretend we have no props. Ooh, we got something about pelvic muscles on Thursday. Okay. I will answer that question. Okay, so his question is, you'd mentioned something about pelvic muscles on Thursday. When do I engage them and when do I do not? The pelvic floor muscles, we call them the Kegel muscles. Everybody has them. When you have to go to the bathroom really bad and there's not one nearby and you have to hold your pee, those are the muscles. So right now, just to feel like, just to feel like you have to hold your pee, right? You can't, you can't, there's no bathroom nearby. There's no toilet paper. Toilet paper is completely gone. No one has it squeeze. That's your pelvic floor muscles. So that engagement of the muscle, we actually want to do that the entire, 
practice the whole time. The only time you let those muscles relax is Shavasana. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so if you want to go a little bit deeper with that, there's three main, um, in, in yoga philosophy, there are three main bandhas or core pieces of energy in the body. One is that area, the pelvic floor. Two is your solar plexus, low diaphragms, which is where we have that belly breath, right? That, that's a diaphragmatic breathing, expanding from the belly, from the diaphragm, and squeezing out to this engagement. Your third is your throat, which was your question about chin to chest, right? That, they feel, engages that bandha. When you're using your ujjayi breath, the tongue at the bottom of the mouth, and that echoing sound, the engagement of the glottis muscle in your throat to make that ujjayi sound, that's the engagement here. So you have one, two, three. Um, this is engaged from breathing and from any of those neck movements you do in a practice. This is engaged already from breathing and then from our core, every time that we squeeze in and engage. So these are kind of a little bit easier to engage. Your pelvic floor one is not so easy. That one is you have to consciously engage it and you have to really be aware of it. Um, what that also does, so uh, theoretically, it is something that pulls your energy in and up. So if you're doing like a power yoga class, they would very emphasize that muscle because it keeps your energy up and up. Um, it is a fire heating. Then, um, and because they believe that if uh, it's believed if the muscle is relaxed in your practice, you're letting energy fall out of you. You're not holding it in. Yeah. But scientifically, physically, that engagement of your pelvic floor, it also engages the muscles, your stability muscles, and your sac uh, sacroiliac joint. Yeah just here. So if you have your lumbar is up here and your sacral joint is right here. And the engagement of your pelvic floor muscles engages the stability muscles in that joint. So for someone like me that has SI dysfunction, which is very common in women, women who have given birth and hypermobile women, I'm all three. Um, it's a, that, my, that joint for me is very sensitive and it destabilizes very easily and it, it hurts very easily. So the pelvic floor engagement throughout a yoga practice does wonders, wonders. It's awesome, um, especially in forward folds. So I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, let me know. If you have more questions, let me know. Um, okay, so I, I asked many times. It's all good, I keep checking. So let's do shoulder stand. Yeah, cool. you're welcome. Shoulder stand is considered a restorative pose. It is a pose that is believed that if you hold it for 10 minutes, it is equal to the effect of three hours of sleep. I have never tested this theory, but if you do, let me know. I was curious. Shoulder stand, if you have a lot of neck issues, this might not be the pose for you. And you can just skip it or you can just watch and that's fine too. Um, remember, when you're in the pose, do not turn your head ever, ever. <laughs> Please don't do it. Um, and other we'll, we'll go step by step, just pieces. Yeah? All right. So this for a little bit, I'm not going to be looking at the screen. So I'll check it back in when we're done. How you would start in shoulder stand is just on your back. And this is always an option in my classes. When we do our spinal rolls, at the end of class, I always tell you people, if you want to do your shoulder stand or your plow, you can do it then. Um, but it takes such a long time to really teach it. That's why I want to do that today. This is your shoulder stand today. Option. Legs up. We call this waterfall when there's no wall. Just waterfall. This is a great pose to do if you're not able to do shoulder stand or if you just want to come out of shoulder stand but still get the inversion, right? Inversions or um, a part of our bodies that are usually below the heart and head go above the heart and head. So even if I were just sitting and doing this, my arms are in an inversion. And they're above the heart and head. It's an unnatural, it's, it's not a usual position. So that's all inversions are. They sound scary, but they're not. Legs up, they're above heart and head. So my legs are in an inversion. It reduces blood pooling reduces fluid buildup, really, really nice in rejuvenation. Like, you can also do lots of stuff here, too. Use the core, test the waters. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to look to the side anymore. So if you have to look, come down, right? 
Arms down. And I'm gonna lift my hips up and down. And that's it. And even just that is working my back and core muscles. And that just, it can be very little. It can just be one little itch. Just that lift of the hips and tailbone. And that builds up the strength to get it higher. And then eventually one day you get so high that you can take your hands and bring them up underneath your hips, your low back. Now I've seen shoulder stands that look like this. We're gonna come out of the pose if you need to before you look. And this is not bad, okay? This is fine, this is okay. If it feels weird or wrong or painful, then you come out. Shoulder stand is meant to feel really good in your body. If it feels weird, then you just come out for a little bit. Holding onto that low back, you start to tuck your elbows and your shoulders in, just like you did in that bridge. Tuck them in underneath you as much as you can. Your legs are engaged, they're extended. They're not just kind of hanging there. Extend and reach as if you're gonna to touch the ceiling. Being careful not to flatten your whole neck against the ground. If you were to do that, that means that your chin would tuck in, your clothes off your throat, your breath, and you can't talk. Also, it would mean you're hyperextending your neck. We don't want that either. So there's a little itty bitty lift in your chin. The back of your neck has a little space between it and the floor. Push into the back of the shoulders. An option from here is to bring one or both legs out over the head. This is your plow pose. Because you've brought your feet to the ground for support, you can let the hands go if you want to, and even bring in a moment to kind of tuck a little bit more. Plow is very fun, I like it. You can bring your knees by the ears. You can just do one leg. You can play in your shoulder stands with lotus, cobbler, tree, stag, splits, twist. Again, it's all just set to feel good. Your neck never hurts in this pose. When you would come down, just guide it down, untuck the shoulders. Slow, slow, slow. You can hang out in waterfall or bring the knees in and rock. So it's a really lovely pose. It's just, you saw how much explanation it takes and I don't want people to be trying the pose in a, in a flow class and looking around at the screen because again, I don't want anyone to hurt their necks. So it's just one that needs a little bit more care, a little bit more time and explanation. Um, and then let me just talk to you about Shavasana real quick. You're like, oh yay, Shavasana. We're not gonna have a whole Shavasana though. Um, this will be your last pose for today, all right? Shavasana, you're traditionally laying on the floor. Our arms are traditionally about 45 degrees from the body, plus corpse pose. What I see all the time, people have their arms like this, people have their arms like this. And it's actually not quite as soft in the shoulders to have it here and here, to have them a little bit down, but not too close, right? We don't want to squeeze, we want space. Our armpits are a hot spot of the body, a very heating spot. So Shavasana is a cooling pose, right? So we open the arms, armpits and we let air come into them and your palms are open. It's feeling, it's a, it's a, a physical gesture of surrender, of openness, vulnerability, and acceptance, right? If our palms are down, it's a closing off um, symbol, physical gesture. We want ourselves to be open. Also, when you have your palms down, you can see that it rotates the arm and it rotates the shoulder forward. You know, we're trying to open, right? So when you open the palm, it rotates the arm back and it lets your shoulder pull back much easier, a lot softer. So you'd be on your back, arms out to about 45 degrees, palms up. Your legs are open wide. We want the legs open wide enough that your feet fall open, your thighs fall open. I see a lot of times in Shavasana, people have their legs all the way together. And the thing is to hold your legs like that, it's tight. It, it takes effort and it takes activation, which is not what we want. 
I see people all the time with their thighs and their knees pointed straight up. Again, this is a tight, this is effort. So when you open up you can allow, and allow everything to relax, watch my legs. So there's kind of roll out. The holding in, people do this all the time, they hold it in and they don't even know they're doing it. Relax, roll it up. So you can even just shake your legs out like this, side to side, to loosen things up and to feel the difference. You can feel it when you go in and you can feel it when you go out and then stay out. And that's your softness, right? Options, you have your rolled up towel or blanket. If you have low back hip issues, it feels good to bring that blanket underneath your thighs. Just that little lift of the thighs brings a bit more comfort into your hips and your low back. If you don't have a blanket or if that doesn't feel good for you, your option, another option is to open your feet up wide and lean the knees together. I see this all the time. This takes effort against activation. Relax. How do you know? Again, you can just swish it side to side and then end together. Relax. This is nice for the low back and the hips as well. And that's your Shavasana. When you come out of Shavasana, it's just as important as any transition of a pose. You would bring the knees in, rock, go off to the side. This is, this is where everyone tends to stay together. That's good. Where I lose a lot of people is coming out of this pose right here. This is our little uh, fetal position. What I see all the time is this. I give the key I say, okay, we come up to a comfortable sitting position. They're all relaxed sleepy, heavy, and then I see this. <sighs> no. <laughs> we want to stay in that relaxed, heavy, sleepy position, right? So when you're coming out of your fetal position here, we take that top hand and we're going to press. And the head stays heavy. And you're just walking the hand in. This takes very little effort. Your core and your back muscles don't engage so much as they would be rolled over and rocked back up and threw yourself in the sink. So you kind of press up gently. The head would stay down the whole time. And the head would be the very last thing to lift. 